Okay, this session is called Terminal Velocity, and it is going to be a primer on some of the basic skills that you need in order to be able to navigate a terminal uh, command line and get up and running with um, some of the uh, more popular deep learning repositories that you can find online. This is basically an addendum to the, previ to the last class that we just had at ITP, Neural Aesthetic, uh, Fall 2018 where we just learned how to do, um, uh, we learned all about um, style transfer, texture synthesis, and other sort of optimization-based uh, approaches to creating interesting visual art using neural networks, um, deep dream and all that. And so this is kind of an addendum to that, um, just trying to um, basically now go through the tutorials of how to actually get that set up and running. Um, the basic contents of this, um, this, this lesson this should be pretty short. Uh, we're going to learn really, really basic uh, navigation skills for a terminal, running command line, um, navigating your file systems, copying, moving files and all that, uh, running bash scripts and, um, and running a Python shell, running Python scripts. And then we're going to move on to uh, setting up a remote virtual machine on a service called Paperspace. Paperspace is a, uh, a website that, that is, um, cre creates kind of a user-friendly interface for setting up uh, remote computers um, has a lot of nice templates that let us get up and running with um, some of the uh, software that's needed to do uh, deep learning uh, quite quickly. And so I've been using it a lot for workshops. We're gonna we're gonna kind of do a basic uh, run through of that. Uh, and, and we're also gonna see how to use Paperspace to create a remote Jupyter Lab session. I use Jupyter Lab for a lot of my Teaching as well, Jupyter Lab is an environment for executing Python code, mixed notes, and things things of that sort. Uh, then after that, we're gonna look at Neural Style, which is a, a really popular GitHub repository that implements um, the original optimization-based approach towards style transfer and texture synthesis. Uh, it's a repository by Justin Johnson. Then I'm going to show you the Neural Synth notebook, uh, which is part of the ML Frey Guides collection. Neural Synth is kind of, uh, let's call it Deep Dream++. Plus plus. It's Deep Dream, the original Deep Dream, which I talked about earlier today, um, and some extended techniques for making interesting, uh, making interesting graphics. And uh, that'll kind of lead to the final thing, which is gonna be an introduction to the ML for a guides more generally, how to get those running, how to uh, use those as a, as a learning material to, to both learn uh, Keras, which is um, kind of the, the main um, library that I use for uh, getting people uh, up and running with uh, coding deep learning stuff and also just in general how to do stuff in Python, NumPy, uh, inside of a Jupyter Lab session in a remote VM. Um, so all of those things will be crammed into this very short lesson um, and this should be a really good introduction to some of the more uh, interesting things that we'll be covering in the rest of this course. Next week we're going to get into generative models um, training our own data sets, uh, tra training GANs and autoencoders and all of that good stuff. Um, and so we're going to need basic literacy with the command line in order to do that effectively. And so this is what this uh, session is all about. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to exit here and I'm just going to show you a few very basic terminal commands that you should be familiar with. So this is a Mac OS terminal. Uh, you th this this applies equally well to Mac and Linux. Um, if you have Linux, you're probably already familiar with a lot of this stuff. Um, things are a little bit different in Windows. If you're using um, MS DOS command prompt, um, I would highly encourage you to get uh, either Commander or one of the other sort of Bash emulators that you can have in Windows. I believe some of the newer Windows versions support Bash natively. There's uh, there's a Bash for Windows, uh, something like that. And um, so uh, otherwise this applies to, to kind of um, typical uh, Mac OS systems. Terminal is an application that lets you interface with, with the command line. And I'm gonna show you some basic, uh, basic things that you can do with it. So whenever you're inside of a terminal, you're running commands and um, you're always, the, the first thing to understand is that you're always inside of a root directory. So right now, you can always check what directory you're, you're in by running pwd, present working directory. So you can see that this returns users gene, this is my home folder. So when you start a terminal, by default, it opens in your home folder. You can inspect the contents of your folder using the command ls. 
So you can see that I have a whole bunch of stuff in my home folder. None of it is um, important for this for purposes of this. But um, you know, you'll see your documents folder, your pictures, your your um, movies, music, and all that. You can change folders by going to let's say um, let's say you want to go into one of these folders like CD audio. So I can click CD. That means change directory audio. Now I'm inside the audio directory. I can oops, I can tell because if I run pwd, I'm inside of audio. All references to files are always uh, with respect to the root folder that you are in, right? So if, if I press ls and there's there's all of these uh, folders in it and and a file like this right here, if I want to reference that file, it, it is with respect to the folder that we are in. Okay, so that means that you can either supply whole paths or relative paths, and we'll see that in a few when we run the bash script. So, uh, in order to navigate up back a folder, you can do cd dot dot. So dot dot means parent directory, right? So now we're back inside of the home. So um, let's do some some basic things. So again, I can inspect the contents of this folder. So let's just look, I have a, a little file here called make1.sh. I don't remember what it's for. It's probably not important. Um, but let's suppose I want to copy that file. Easy enough, cp make1.sh, make2.sh. And now I can inspect the contents and I see that I have copied the file and they are both right here. Um, let's, if you want to delete a file, you can get rid of it like that. If you want to uh, create a new file, you can use the command touch. Touch new file .txt. So now if I look inside here, there's a file called touch.txt. Uh, sorry, new file.txt. We can open it using the open command, and that'll use whatever um, whatever your uh, default program for opening text file is. For me, it's TextMate. You see it's a blank file. So I can write some stuff in here. Hello world. And then save it, exit. And now that, that file has been written. If I want to read the contents of a file in the terminal, I can actually do so using the command cat. So cat new file.txt. So here, so I can write some stuff in here. Hello world, right? Um, I can move a file. So suppose I want to move the file, new file, into my documents directory. So I can write documents slash, right? You don't actually don't need the slash. You can just do move new file documents. Now, new file is gone. It's inside of the documents folder. I can move it back by running um, move new file oops, move documents new file dot txt dot dot means here so whatever your current directory is so dot dot is up to your parent directory and uh, dot and and dot um, one dot is here current directory so I'll run that and now new file is back here okay so you can see it right over here. So that's the basics of running um, a uh, file, uh, run, running some basic like uh, finder operations, moving files around, creating new files, um, and um, and so and so on. Those are sort of the basics of navigating the terminal. Another thing I want to mention before I forget, I've been doing this tab to complete. Um, so you might have noticed that every once in a while I, I automatically complete a file name that I begin to type. So for example, this file image 2174, if I start to make a reference to it, let's say in the middle of a copy command, cpimg, I can press tab and it will complete the file name if there are no collisions, if there's no other files that have um, the same, um, that, that have the same um, uh, constraints. Next thing I wanna do is show you <clears throat> um, how to run a Python shell. So within terminal, you can always launch a Python shell. So if you just write Python, now you're inside the Python interpreter. So you can run Python commands. So I can be like, okay, print 
hello world, we'll print, we can do computations, we can import NumPy libraries, you know, we can create arrays. Basically, we're inside of a normal Python environment, and we can write Python scripts here directly, um, which is kind of a nice thing. So, and and we'll we'll kind of start to we'll use this a little bit more when we start to use some of the Python uh, repositories for doing uh, some of the things that we'll look at in future weeks. You can exit the Python shell by pressing Control Z, and so now there's no more Python. Um, Another thing to be aware of is, is uh, bash scripts. So for example, um, let's suppose you have a Python program you want to create that'll do something, right? So let's, let's actually create a new Python program. We're gonna say run1.py, okay? Now we can open run1.py and um, we can do something like import time, time.sleep 10, 10 seconds. Um, print program began program oops, and then print program is finished so now I can go back here and I can run this program so it writes program began and now it'll count 10 seconds and then it will it'll end the program here um, now uh, and then this is how to run uh, general, generally speaking, run Python programs. Now, suppose we wanted to um, script a number of Python programs to happen at the same time, or sorry, not happen at the same time, but happen consecutively. So let's create a script called run.sh. Now I'm gonna open run.sh, and we're gonna run Python. We're gonna, and, and, and a bash script is gonna be, basically it's a series of terminal commands that you can place one line at a time. So I can say, okay, Python run one dot pi. Maybe after that we can do ls. You know, this doesn't, isn't doing anything functional, but it's kind of useful. And then run pwd, right, something like that. So I'm gonna go ahead and save that. So it's first it's gonna run the, this program, then it's gonna look at the current directory, then it's gonna run the program again, and then it will um, uh, basically give us the present working directory. So now I'm going to close this, gonna close that as well. And now to run a bash script, we can say sh run.sh. So now it's running all of these commands in sequence. So the first thing it's doing is it's running the Python program that we ran, run1.py. Now it just finished, and now it printed all of the contents of our directories using ls. Then it started running the program again. It's going to wait 10 seconds, and then it's going to then it's finished, and and it prints the current working directory. So this is a useless script, but, but here the idea is that you can run, um, you can string a series of commands that you need in some sequence, um, in any way that you want inside of a bash script inside of an sh file, which just automates the process of bash scripting as we're doing right now. One last thing to be aware of with the terminal before we move on is the command nohub. So a lot of times we'll, we'll um, like when you run a command, let's say you run a Python program, if you exit the terminal, the Python program will quit. So whatever you have running in the terminal will uh, automatically be stopped when you exit the shell. And this is also true, like in particular, let's say this is very valuable um, to know for when you're um, on the remote virtual machine, like when you're logged into another computer, um, if you get disconnected, whatever you happen to be running at that time will, will stop. Um, and so this is um, often a big concern. So one way to, um, to actually um, preserve running programs, even when you exit the terminal, is using a um, command called nohub. And nohub is going to let us, um, it, it stands for no hang up. It will let us actually place the, uh, the program into the background of the computer as a running process and then we can exit the terminal as we wish and still be in the foreground. So the way that we do that is let's say we want to run um, sh.run.sh again but this time we want to we want to run it in the background. So in the beginning of this I'm going to say no hub and so now it's no hub sh.run.sh and we have to give it a log file where it will redirect the output of this program and place it into the um, into this text file instead of the terminal. 
So we can just say like my log dot txt. So this means run the command sh run dot sh, no hang up, place the results into my log dot txt. And then finally, if you place an ampersand at the end, this will regain, this will background the process and regain con the foreground control of the terminal. So basically the command will just go into the background. So if we go ahead and run this, now this command is running and going into mylog.txt. We can quickly print the uh, contents of mylog.txt and we see that there's, um, yeah, there's nothing in it at the moment. There we go. If we run it again, we see that when the program began, the program is finished and it uh, ls did ls just as we expected. Uh, the program is still running in the background, so if we run it again, we see that now it's finished. So see again, it, uh, it program began, program finished, did an ls dump, and then program began again, program is finished, and then pwd for our current working directory, and now everything is done. Okay, so now I just wanna clean up. I'm gonna get rid of this run run one.py. Oh, one uh, thing you can, all, you can do sometimes is, like for example, if you wanna get rid of everything called run, you can do rm run star and star is a variable that means anything that's called run anything else will be removed. Be very careful with this because you may um, delete files off your system and they don't go into the recycling bin. So that's important. So usually it's best to do this kind of um, piecemeal. So remove run one.py, remove run.sh. Okay, so now we are done with the terminal. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do is show you paper space. I'm going to exit the, I'll leave the terminal up and I'm just going to go into paperspace.com. Paperspace is a service that's basically a cloud computing platform. It lets you spin up virtual machines in the cloud and have access to them online. I'm going to show you, I'm going to take you through it right now. Um, once you sign up for an account, you have to put in your credit card number. It's a pretty low charge if you use the machines hourly. It's usually, you know, like a few cents per hour unless you're using the GPUs, then it's like 50 cents per hour. Um, and it costs a few dollars per machine per month to hold on to the memory. Um, and um, so there's kind of no way around this. If you do end up doing a lot of computation, of course, it's, it's useful to have access to um, yeah, uh, machines that, that um, don't run up the bill so much. Um, there's various ways to do this. It's not super easy. Um, if you are, of course, for ITP students, NYU students, you have access to NYU's um, HPC, that's the High Performance Compute, um, which anyone can get an account for with approval. And so that's kind of free computation. So that's that's another avenue um, towards this. But for the purposes of education, this, this is um, a, a reasonably easy way to get started. Once you have an account, you can sign in. <clears throat> so um, I'm gonna go ahead and place my credentials. I have a... Uh, sign in okay so now I'm inside of my console um, and I'm gonna create a new machine from scratch and um, later in this semester we're gonna look at using gradient which is um, something that's like a job runner on demand um, this is kind of the most powerful thing that we can use because it allows us to, um, uh, to, to basically run jobs in the cloud without spinning up a whole virtual machine and having to manage it uh, we're, we're going to get into that later. For, for today, we're just going to start with uh, having a whole machine to ourselves. So if I click New Machine, uh, first you pick the region. I'm going to go with East Coast because that's where I happen to be nearest to. And then there's a whole bunch of templates that you can start with. And we want to go straight into the public templates. There's a few uh, very nicely um, done public templates that have a bunch of the software that we need already set up. The one that I'm going to select is the ML in the box, Ubuntu 16.04. So what this is, is a fresh Ubuntu 16.04 um, uh, installation, which already has CUDA and uh, TensorFlow and some of the other important deep learning libraries set up out of the box. Um, later, you can make your own templates. You can make custom templates once you have set up some code and data and libraries um, can be useful to create a template so that you can spin up a machine based off of it later. Um, but for now, we're just going to go with the, the ones that are publicly available, the Ubuntu. Now pick a machine. 
the GPU Plus is kind of the standard here. This 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 has um, uh, one Quadro M M4000, so that's a GPU that has about 12 gigabytes of VRAM, and uh, costs about 50 cents per hour to use. So it's it's not cheap um, compared to the CPU only machines, uh, but for educational purposes, not so bad. So I'm gonna go ahead and use 100 gigabytes of storage. So that's a, that's gonna cost seven dollars a month. That's prorated for however long you have it happen to have it running you can spin up more machines if you want I'm just gonna go ahead and do one uh, default network is fine and the other thing that I'd like to do is to have a public IP address that will let me access the machine from another computer rather than just through the paper space um, default instance you want to be careful because the public IPs are not deleted um, through the machines they're actually deleted through public IPs over here so if you have an errant IP address um, that isn't being used for anything, they will charge you for it, like $3 a month. Um, so that's something to be aware of. Um, I got caught with that uh, just a few months ago. Um, personally, I think it should delete when you when you delete the machine, but that's just how things work. Anyhow, um, I'm gonna have a public IP, and you put in your, your credit card will be selected, and I'm gonna go ahead and create a machine. So you click create your paper space, and then it you won't have this if you're in a fresh install. Um, this is another machine I'm using separately. And over here, the um, the uh, machine is being spun up. At first, they are they write provisioning, which just means that it's um, basically provisioning the VM in the paper space cloud. This usually takes a few minutes, um, basically to provision the machine for you. And what will happen is when it's done, uh, it'll say that it's ready, and they will send you an email which has the temporary sign-in password of this machine. So you're gonna to have to check with your email uh, because it's gonna have a temporary password that you need to, to be able to log into it. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna go ahead and wait, wait for that to be provisioned. Once the machine is ready, um, you'll see that they, uh, they have sent you an email that has the password to the machine. Now, if you just click directly on the machine, it's going to take you into, uh, Paperspace has this kind of um, nice little interface for um, interfacing with the machine directly. So this is the desktop, and I have access to the terminal of this uh, computer. So this is not my own terminal anymore. This is actually the terminal inside the cloud. Um, I actually don't like to interface with the machine this way. It's a little clunky sending pixels over the network. And so I actually want to go back, and I want to show you how to interface with the machine not this way. Instead, I'm going to click the little gears icon here, and I'm going to um, note that the public IP is over here. So this is the in, the way that we can interface with the machine. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the terminal. First of all, I'm going to copy this. So I've copied the IP address. Now I'll go back to my terminal and create a new tab here, and I'm going to SSH into the machine. So I'll go paper space, SSH paper space at the IP address. So this will let you log into the computer that you just created. You copy your IP address and you do SSH paper space at, one, uh, at your IP address. SSH stands for secure shell. So first it'll say the authenticity of host it can't be established. So yes, you want to connect. And now it'll ask you for your password. And this is the temporary password that Paperspace has sent you in your email. So check your email for this. And um, I'm going to go ahead and read off my own. So my password is, I'm just reading it from my email. And now I am, oh, got it wrong. Let's do that again. There we go. Okay. So now I'm inside this new machine. So if I go PWD again, this is no longer my own computer. I'm actually inside the remote computer called Paperspace. First thing I want to do, this is optional, but but I like to change the password because I don't, um, you know, it's, it sends you a random password, so it's hard to memorize. You'll be using the password a lot, so it's best to change it right away. And the way you want to do that is using sudo passwd Paperspace. Sudo um, basically gives you is uh, asks for administrator privileges. So a lot of um, things that you can do in the machine are restricted if you don't have um, administrator privileges. And um, so so um, for example, changing the password. So sudo 
uh, is a command that will ask you for your password if you haven't entered it recently. Um, in, in our case, I think we already have, so it won't ask us, but this is, yeah, just know that that's administrator privileges. So I'll go sudo pass, pass wd paper space, and it'll ask me for a new password. I'm gonna create a new password that only I know. And now that's the password. Okay. So now I have access to the paper space machine. You'll notice that this has a whole new directory structure. Um, this is not my own computer. This is the, uh, the uh, remote computer that I'm controlling, the remote VM from paper space. If I run a Python shell, it's inside of there. You'll notice right away that if you used the, um, if you used the, um, uh, the, the same template as me, you'll notice that you already have TensorFlow, which is really nice. Um, it also comes, I believe, with Keras, yeah, which is using TensorFlow backend, it has NumPy, it has SciPy, um, it has lots of things that we need, right? So SciPy, maybe sklearn, and so on. So there's, uh, and, and even, I think maybe even OpenCV, yeah. Not sure about Dlib. No, that one's not there. That's okay, you don't need that. Um, these are just like some standard libraries that you'll be using for a lot of things. I'm gonna exit the Python shell. Uh, back I am in here. And what I wanna do is I actually want to interface with the computer using something called Jupyter Lab. And Jupyter Lab is a, um, a really, really nice program that is being developed by the Jupyter Foundation that kind of lets you um, interface with a coding environment inside of the browser, um, interlaced with, with notes in, written in Markdown. It's really, really convenient. Um, there's some debate over whether or not it's good for learning, but I'm using it for now, so let's go with it. Um, the way that you're going to start the Jupyter instance is to go Jupyter, that's spelled with a Y, Jupyter with a Y, lab, and then I'm going to do dash dash no dash browser. This means um, don't launch a browser on the machine because we can't actually access it because we're inside of a terminal. And so instead I'm going to launch the browser and then connect to it with a tunnel from my computer. So first I launch it and now Jupyter Lab is going to launch. And it says, okay, you can go to this address with this token, and that will allow you to get into the new Jupyter Lab instance that you've, that you've spun up. Um, now, if I just go to this right now, I'm not gonna see anything because localhost, localhost means this machine. Generally, it's an alias for this machine. However, of course, we're inside the terminal in the paper space remote machine very far away somewhere. And so um, what it's actually doing is it's referring to that computer itself. So we can't actually, localhost doesn't mean anything here. Instead of what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a remote connection to it from uh, another terminal. So I'm gonna create a new tab and now I'm back inside of my own terminal. And now I'm gonna write ssh-nl. We're gonna establish a connection between the, the um, port that Jupyter is being served over on the remote machine to some port on my own machine. And by default, it's very customary to use 8157. You can use a different number, it's just a convention. So we'll do 8157. And then this is going to be, where is it going to? So localhost, it's gonna serve it on our, our own localhost, and then connect to the port 8888. And it's 8888 because that's the port that Jupyter is being served over here. So make sure you have those two connected. Sometimes it's 8889 or 8890. Um, just make sure that you always match it. And then you'll go paper space, at, go back and grab that IP address. And now it's going to ask for a password again. This is my new password because I've changed it. And then it'll hang. And if it hangs, that means it's doing it correctly. So I'm gonna open a new window we go localhost 8157 and now it asks now we're connected to the remote computer it asks for a password token for security purposes to make sure that you are who you say you are we have the token written right here in the, the previous window so I'm going to copy that place it in here log in and now I'm inside Jupyter lab environment for the remote paper space computer and it looks like this All right, so here's my home directory and uh, we're, we're home free. So we have access to the terminal, another terminal again that we can, we can kind of spin up and we can go ls, and pwd, and so on and so forth. So we have our basic environment set up and now we can get to doing cool stuff.
Okay, the next thing I'm gonna do is take a little tour of NeuralStyle. Um, so basically this is a, um, a program that will let us do style transfer and, te and texture synthesis. Actually, before I do that, I wanna take you on a little tour of Jupyter Notebook and Jupyter in general. So um, we can, uh, so we have a file system here. We can browse it like any other. And um, you can see running processes in this tab right over here. And that's kind of most of the stuff that I use is the files and running processes. We can create new folders with this right here. So this creates a new folder, hello world. Um, I can delete that and so on. It's just a, a very basic file system. And this can refresh it. Um, now, if you want to create a new tab here, we can press the plus button. And now we have the option to create a new notebook, a Python shell, or a terminal, or a text file. So if we go ahead and open terminal, you've already seen this. This just opens a terminal, pretty standard. Um, if we want to create a new text file, this is a new text file. Okay, and you can rename it. You can make it a Python file if you want. Um, but basically we have that. I'm going to delete that. The next thing I want to show you is actually the Jupyter shell, uh, Jupyter notebook shell. So Jupyter notebooks is uh, basically this environment that lets you uh, write Python code inside of the browser and what what's actually happening here is that when i go you know print hello world five plus five and i press the play button it'll run this it'll run the command and execute it and the important thing to understand is that i'm writing the text inside of my local browser and it's sending the command over the network to the paper space vm executing it with python there then then wrapping up the results and sending them back to me so I'm actually doing all of the execution, all of the computations being done on the remote machine. Um, so this is kind of a really, really convenient way to interface with the machine, to, to have it run um, you know, code for you. And, um, and the other nice thing about JupyterLab is, you know, besides for just doing you know, basic Python stuff, we can actually create notes. So if I change this cell to be, instead of code, to be a markdown cell, I can write standard markdown. This is a header. Here is some notes about my uh, computation. Um, I really enjoy Jupyter Lab. Right. Oops. So if I execute this, it'll actually just render it as Markdown. So this is kind of nice because you can you can interlace notes and um, execution. Now the execution is not order preserving, right? So basically like I can create a cell here and run, you know, h equals negative five. So if I print h, it's negative five. If I do h plus nine, it's equal to four now, negative five plus, now, now if I do h equals, you know, h plus six, this doesn't change here. But if I re-execute it, now it's one, right? So the cells kind of are just kind of keeping a constant, um, order non-preserved execution. So you have a state and any cell can update the state. This can be confusing for people for the first time um, because usually you think of a program as kind of running from top to bottom and it's not really the case here anymore if you don't want it to be. Um, nevertheless, it's kind of nice for, for preservation of notes. And you'll see later when with the ML4A guides what the notes could be uh, useful for. So I'll rename this to you know my basic notebook. Okay. And I can get out of that and it's actually still running. So I can always go back to it if you'd like. So like if I go back to it, it's, it's actually still all the computation has been preserved. If you actually want to shut it down, um, oh, well, we can save it. And if you want to shut it down, you actually have to go into running and kill it. So shut down and, um, and so on. So that, that's, that's the really basic stuff with Jupyter Lab. We're going to use it for some of the things that we're, um, that we're going to do later in the term. Um, we're not going to really use it for the rest of, um, uh, well, actually, yeah, we'll use it again for neural, neural synthesis. So now um, I want to go ahead and uh, show you how to use neural style. So um, if you go to neural style, if you search for it, you'll see there's a JC Johnson neural style. Okay, and that's a GitHub repository here. Okay, I'm going to copy the URL here. I'll go back into Jupyter and I'm going to run from the terminal git clone neural style. 
So Git is a versioning software. Um, get used to it if you want to do stuff with code. Git clone will make a copy of the repository and put it on in our computer in the home directory at this point. So you can see that it just showed up neural style here. And if you look at it, you'll see that the contents of neural style in our folder matches the contents that you'll find in the actual repository here. And um, so that's kind of nice. We have, um, you know, we have a way of keeping it in sync with the upstream repository, which is on GitHub. Um, so this is something that you'll get used to when you when you start using Git a lot. For for now, we'll just kind of use it to, to copy things. Now, um, one thing about the paper space, um, the the paper space default machine is that um, it has some problems. Actually, um, the default installation won't run neural style effectively because there's a few libraries that are missing. Uh, that we have to kind of get set up. And uh, just for making this a little faster, I have a gist uh, for using this on um, my GitHub. So if you go to gist.github.com um, slash Gene Kogan, you'll see um, over here fix.sh. You have to run this stuff to kind of get everything working for neural style. So this will fix uh, Lurax. There's some problems with Lurax, which is the package manager for torch so the first thing i want to do is i'm gonna i'm just gonna go ahead and um, copy these first five commands basically um actually i'm gonna copy all of it uh, except for the neural style stuff i just want to run these commands to fix neural style and um, this will also install cudnn which um, the, or the torch bindings for cudnn which is a, a library that lets us um, more effectively use the graphics card uh, in a more memory efficient way. And I'm just gonna copy that and I'm going to have, go ahead into the terminal and just paste them in. And now it's gonna start executing them. This is gonna take like five to 10 minutes to install some of these libraries. It's building a whole bunch of uh, libraries that we need um, in order to run um, neural style effectively. So I'm gonna pause it and come back to it when, when this has all been finished. Um, once that is done, um, now the, the other thing you have to do is now go into neural style, so cd into there, and you'll see that uh, this asks you to clone it, and, and actually we've already done that, so now we're inside of it, and now you also have to download the models. So if you run this sh script, this bash script that we just looked at, you'll see, you can actually look into it and, and see um, what it is. Download models at sh, it just wgets, um, basically wget is a command for downloading stuff off the web, and this will um, just basically download the models for us. So I'm going to go ahead and run that, and it'll take a little it'll take a little bit of time to download the model, um, just a couple of minutes. Um, so I'll come back when it's done. Okay, once that's done, you should see that the download has finished, and now we can actually go ahead and run neural style. So the first thing I want to do is like um, just get some basic image. Um, so if I um, open a new tab and we'll go into images and uh, you know find ourselves um, something to look at maybe maybe a dog yeah why not <laughs> okay very cute why not so I'm going to actually I'm gonna copy the address of this I think this should work actually so if I copy the image address I'll go back in the paper space I can actually W get that image into this folder, did that actually work? Yeah, it looks like it did. Uh, let's have a look and see what that looks like. No, okay, well, I think as long as it's actually, no, it doesn't work that way. Okay, so let's just make sure that we get an actual image of a dog. Uh, yeah, that's no good, so let's, Let's try one that's actually going to give us like a regular JPEG. Um, that's cute enough. Yeah. So let's open this image in a new tab. And all of these dynamic images, very annoying. How about this one? There we go, an actual JPEG. Great. So now I'm going to do wget this. Let's call it dog.jpg. Okay, so 
now. Oh, well, that didn't seem to work. Okay, so let's delete this and delete this. And now we have our dog. Great, let's just call that dog. And let's get a style image. So how about, um, what's a good style? Uh, let's use something, um, hmm. so that's something that I haven't done so much. Uh, let's do Georgia Oki, why not? Uh, let's look and get something relatively big. Uh, I think I think this should do. Um, sure, why not? Okay, well, let's copy this image address. Okay, I'm gonna get out of that. Go back in the paper space, wget. Okay, and that downloads that. And now we have Georgia. Okay, so now let's run narrow style. So you can see the documentation more completely inside of here. The basic thing, the basic command is given to you over here. It just goes to do a simple neural style. You do th neural style, supply the path to the style image, supply the path to the content image, and also you can supply the path to the output image. Otherwise, just output.png by default. So we'll go th neural style Lua, tap to complete, dash style image, we'll say georgia.jpg, dash content, image, we'll say dog, and then dash output image, let's just call it Georgia dog, and we'll make it a PNG. So let's go ahead and run that, and it'll load the model, successfully loads the model, loads the network, and then within a few moments, uh, it gives us all the details of the network, all the layers, and uh, within a moment, it'll begin to update us on the uh, actual process. And style transfer works in iterations. Um, so if you want to know a little bit more about how style transfer works, please refer to the previous lecture that we did, lecture four, uh, sorry, lecture five at, at ITP, Neural Aesthetic, about um, optimization-based methods. And what it's doing is it does 1,000 iterations of a, um, a style, style transfer optimization process, calculating the gradient at each step, adding it to the pixels, and um, does this 1,000 times with sort of diminishing returns. It really gets most of it within the first few hundred. It also, for convenience, saves um, every 100 iterations. So it gives us like a snapshot of where it's at. So again, just to remind us, like dog.jpg, georgia.jpg, and now Georgia dog, after 100 iterations, looks like that. After 200 iterations, it looks like this. So you can see it's beginning to converge to a set of features. And it'll take a little while to go through all the way through the first uh, 2,000 iterations. Uh, we can pause it and come back to it and, and have a look and see what it looks like when, when it gets to the end. Uh, recall that it starts from a random, uh, at least if you wish for it to, it starts with a random. Uh, by default, it starts at random pixels and then it begins to change those. So I'm going to pause this and uh, come back when it's done through the first uh, through the thousand iterations. Okay, it's finished, and now we can go ahead and have a look. And there's our Georgia dog. It's very adorable, right? So that's the original dog. That's Georgia O'Keeffe, and there's our Georgia dog. It, it some styles work better than others. Um, it's kind of a hit or miss because things with very obvious features tend to work. So like cubism is, is, is actually tends to be quite good. So like, for example, if we do cubism, you know, and pick one of these, let's, let's look at uh, the, the first abstract style of modern art. Why not? So I'm going to open this in a new tab. I'm going to copy the address Picasso and let's download that. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this again th neural style, except now we're going to use a different style image, which is going to be called Picasso cubism. Content image will use the dog again. And another new thing that I want to show you, uh, output image is going to be Picasso dog png. And then the next thing I want to show you is image size. So image size is a is a flag that lets you set the maximum width, uh, a maximum size dimension. So for example, if the if it's higher than if the content image is taller than it is wide, then there's going to be the height. 
And if it's a uh, normal landscape, then it's gonna be the width. Now by default, it's 512. Now we wanna make it a little bit bigger. Obviously this is not gigantic, it's just 512 by something. Let's try 1024. So if we do 1024, well, let's, let's make it, what happens if we try to make it as big as possible? Like how about 4,000 pixels, right? So image size, 4,000. This will make it, four, blow it up to a size of 4,000. Well, the problem is going to be that the um, network, uh, the, the activations that it has to keep track of blow up um, and we'll get an error. And you see, if you read this, you'll see TH CUDA check memory storage out of memory, right? So we basically do not have enough memory to do 4,000 pixels. We do have enough memory probably to do 1,024 pixels. Um, and, and, and we can actually um, get more miles from memory if we use backend CUDNN. So like I think maybe it tops out around 1,600, let's say. So if I just do image size 1,600, we should get another error because this is a little bit too big um, to do using the normal backend. Yeah, so we get a memory error. But if we do image size 1600 and then select backend CUDNN, CUDNN will make somewhat more efficient use of the, of the graphics card. And this should be able to fit um, roughly 1600. We might also still run out of memory here, but we can, we can actually have a look. Let's see um, if it doesn't run out of memory within the first few seconds, then we know that it's working. And uh, it looks, no, we ran out of memory. <laughs> you can always check how much memory is being used using NVIDIA SMI. Um, and this shows the driver being used. So let's make it a little bit smaller still. Let's try 1400. Okay, and this will get going again at 1400 pixels, which is still quite a bit larger than uh, our previous attempt. And it looks like we made it, right? So this initialized the activations um, at that size. And so there's just enough. We can, we can actually see how much of the memory card is being used in another terminal. So we can write NVIDIA SMI, we'll see that we're using, yeah, almost all of the eight, gig, uh, eight gigabytes of uh, video RAM that we're given. Here's the process, the Lua JIT, that's the throwing Lua, Torch Lua. Um, and yeah, we're, we're almost at capacity. So this, this will, so the, the nice thing is this will make a much bigger image. It does take longer though, um, quite a bit longer because it's proportional to the number of pixels. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and pause this again and wait until it finishes um, the, the, um, uh, the, the full thousand iterations. Okay, we're done. So let's have a look at um, our new image here, Picasso dog. Okay, not too bad. Well, uh, that doesn't look right. Did we do that right actually? It looks like we, we must have uh, chosen Picasso cubism as our style image. Let's have a look at that image. Yeah, well, I guess it's not exactly what I would have expected it to come out to, but yeah, it's kind of more of a color transfer than anything. Yeah, sometimes it doesn't seem to work quite as well depending on what resolution you make. I would have expected more of these kinds of uh, hard features, but yeah, well, in any case, that's the basic idea. One last thing that I wanna do with neural style is introduce the concept of style uh, texture synthesis. So if we simply, rerun this command, let's, let's go to an image size of 1024. And I'm going to make the content image, everything the same basically, except uh, now I'm also going to, well, let's rename the image. So output will say Picasso texture. I wanna run a texture synthesis. And texture synthesis simply means making the content weight zero. So now the content loss does not matter. So if we rerun this, it's going to begin um, to do this process yet again. And uh, we can monitor it after a thousand and see basically what happens. The idea is that it's going to produce a style transfer in which the uh, reconstruction of content is uh, weighted zero. So it doesn't matter. So basically the content's gonna disappear and we should just have a straight texture synthesis um, to look at. So let's come back to that when it's ready. Okay, now that's done. So let's have a look at Picasso texture. And there it is. So it's not amazing, but you can kind of get the idea. So basically it's just capturing aspects of the source texture, not necessarily particularly well, this probably needs a little bit of work, 
um, but there's no original content left to, to be seen. And so that's kind of the idea of texture synthesis, at least uh, the one that kind of piggybacks off this style transfer technique. So um, there's a lot more that you can do with neural style. Um, it's incredibly rich. Uh, please do refer to the previous lecture, uh, lecture number four, number five on style optimization to see some of the things that I've done with it. I'm going to be releasing a library very, very shortly um, that includes information on how to create loops and um, distort the canvas uh, and, and other extended techniques that I've been messing with over the last year or so. And um, so look out for that. That'll be part of the class. I'll probably introduce that in one of the next few lectures. Um, okay, so let's now clean up a little bit. And the next thing I want to do is take you through the neural style notebook. Okay, so basically, um, if you go to ML4A guides, um, you can Google that and it should come up in GitHub, you'll see that the um, neural synth guide um, you can find inside of notebooks. So let's go ahead and actually just go ahead and clone this. I'm going to go into my home directory. Let's go out of here. I'm going to clone ML4A guides. And once that's done cloning, I'm going to go ahead into it. And I want to actually open up the notebook for neural synth. Okay. So this will take a little bit to load. And this basically explains the technique of neural synthesis. So basically piggybacking up off of um, Deep Dream. Um, this is based off of the TensorFlow Deep Dream example and then adding a little bit more to it. Um, so just go ahead and you can read these notes. We went over them in, um, in the class today. And the first thing you need to do is run this cell over here, which is going to run terminal commands. That's the exclamation point here. It's going to download the Inception 5H model, unzip it, and put and place it into the uh, home directory here, into the root directory. So I'm going to run that. And that downloads, takes a moment, inflates it. Now it is, you can actually see that it's, it's been placed um, over here, Inception 5H. This actually contains the um, actual model that we're using. Okay, so next thing you need to do is run these import statements, and that's going to import TensorFlow and also the uh, graph, the, the actual inception graph. And um, you can go ahead and print all the layers here. So this cell block is basically just printing the names of the layers and how many neurons each of them have. And the basic idea is um, for us to uh, basically synthesize images which maximally activate the, the neurons of a particular um, uh, a feature detector. So if we, uh, the, the first thing I'm going to do is just to render naive. This is taken directly from the Deep Dream example in TensorFlow. So if you run this, I'm not going to go over the code too much, but basically this does the, the first process that I described that, that was um, first kind of done by uh, Karen Simonian. And uh, the idea is that it basically will, uh, given some objective, which is to maximize a particular neuron in a particular layer, it will calculate the gradients in this case, the gradients refer to the difference in all of the pixels that needs to be added to the pixels in order to um, iteratively uh, make the objective a little bit more more optimal. Or in other words, to maximally activate the particular neuron that's within the objective, which is this right here. And then it normalizes it by the by the uh, um, normalized by the standard deviation, and then finally adds the gradient to the image. So if we run this. And then we do a simple example. This will basically initialize a 200 by 200 uh, sized image and then pick a layer and the channel. And the cha this should refer to from these layers, layer names, and then this is the number of channels in each one, right? So you can't go above this number of channels, right? So this is one of the middle layers and channel 140. And then basically we plug this into render naive in the following way. Go 40 iterations at a step size of 1.0, and then it's going to go ahead and display it for us. Now, this is not terribly exciting. Um, as you can see, it's, it's pretty bland. So that's the naive technique. It doesn't do such a great job. So we're going to actually improve this using this multi-scaling approach. And basically, the multi-scaling approach is the same thing as naive, except what it does is it goes in several octaves, what are called octaves, and what the octaves are is that you first do the naive rendering process on a particular canvas, and then you resize the canvas by a particular octave ratio, or sorry, octave scale, let's say 1.4 by default. 
So it'll resize that image, it'll scale it upwards, and then do the same process again on the new, on the new image. And then however many octaves you have, let's say three octaves, then for if it's three, it'll do this a second time. It'll blow up the resulting image and then do the same process again at, on the new image. Now, the, this, this may not make sense uh, initially, but the, the basic idea is that by visualizing features at different scales, uh, we were able to tease out the features a little bit better because they may appear naturally at different scales. And, and the reason why it happens at different scales is because the size of the convolutional filter, which is being used in order to detect the features, never changes. Of course, the convolutional filters are fixed. So the size of the image changes, and so the, the, the features that we kind of blew up in the previous iteration, um, they now appear at a larger scale. But we've already calculated them, so they're, they're kind of there. And now we're just kind of zooming in and, and getting the features at a smaller scale. It's, it, it, you can see this, um, this is really nicely explained in the TensorFlow Deep Dream example if you want to get a little bit more details. So I'm going to go ahead and run Render Multiscale. And again, I'm going to pick a random neuron. So let, let's like pick a different layer actually. So I'll pick mixed 5A, 3X, 3 bottleneck pre -relo. I'm gonna copy that. It has 160 neurons. So we gotta go to, um, you know, at most 150, let's say. And go ahead and run that. And it's gonna first create an image of noise. And we picked three octaves at a scale of 1.4. So it's gonna blow it up twice at ratio of 1.4, starting from size 200 by 200. So the, the image will eventually be this much. So 392 by 392. And then we run multi-scale. And uh, we get something like this. Now this is a little bit more interesting. Um, you can kind of see the features now a little bit better than naive technique, but it's still not amazing. And uh, it can get a little better if we think about cleaning up some of this high frequency noise. So one of the problems that we can observe is that the image is full of a lot of like sort of, it's not as visible in this particular example, but, but often you'll see that there's a lot of um, uh, very, very uh, like high frequency noise, like, like really neon colors that are kind of interspersed very closely. And the way we can fix that is using Laplacian normalization. I'm going to skip the next section, which is the same thing, except blowing it up on top of an image. We don't actually have the image here. So you don't have to start with an image of random noise. You can actually just do it on top of a real image, like an example, this image of a dog. Okay, so, so I'm going to skip that and go straight to render lap norm. And render lap norm applies what's called Laplacian normalization. So this is a Laplacian pyramid decomposition. There's a technique in computer vision, which will um, is able to kind of get rid of some of the unnatural, as we might say, high frequency noise. And um, in this case, again, I'm not going to go through all the details. They're a bit out of scope for us. But the point is that it's basically the same as multi-scale rendering, except that it will uh, get rid of some of the high frequency junk and give us much better colors. So if we run this again, mixed 5B pool, I'm just picking these at random. You know, we can actually like try to do this on a different channel. There's 7,500 channels roughly in, in the Inception network, so we could really, and, and their you know, neighboring ones are not next to each other at all. So like if I change this to 98 and do it again after this, you'll see that it comes out quite differently. But let's see how this one is. Okay, so like a lot of really high frequency junk. If you try doing one of the early layers, it'll take less time. And it will also uh, give us more abstract features, which is, which is also kind of a nice feature of this. So like if I go back to this and I change this, to that and let's say 20 and now I calculate this again it's much faster because it only has to propagate to the early layers because it stops it doesn't have to forward propagate to the rest of the layers and then um, each octave of course takes longer because the image canvas becomes bigger and bigger okay, and you get these more abstract features in the early layers if I change this to like 15 let's say it's going to be a totally different channel even it has nothing it's not going to look at all like the previous example um, so that's kind of nice. There's a lot of diversity inside of the network, and that's that's constantly something that we can kind of play with. Okay, lastly, we get to uh, LapNor Multi, and um, in this case, it seems that I'm running out of time, so I have to go to a flight. So all right, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna pause the video here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna finish this when I um, land. So um, okay, see you in just a bit. Okay, so we're back now, um, and okay, kickstarting where we just left off, uh, we just uh, got to lapnor multi. So this function is basically um, at this point is beginning to is a departure from 
what you will see in the um, in the TensorFlow DeepDream example. So this is basically a modification of the uh, last function that you'll encounter in, in there, which does the Laplacian normalization. Except now this time, this function actually takes in, instead of a single objective, which is one channel, one layer, it can take in a list of objectives. So that's going to, so T O B J, this is the objectives, it's now a list instead of just one. And then there's one additional argument, which is this mask. And what mask is, it's basically a NumPy matrix, which is the same width and height as the image that you're generating. And the number of channels it has <clears throat> is equal to the number of objectives. So like, let's say you're um, visualizing two separate neurons, then you'd have two channels in mask. And those two channels would be matrices that contain numbers between zero and one to, to apply the mask. So let me show you an example. I'm going to connect that. And what we're going to do is we're going to generate an image that's 300 by 400, three octaves at a scale of 1.4, 15 iterations. And so then we generate the image, just random uniform noise, and we specify three objectives. I'm just going to change the numbers here so we get different ones, 50, 180. You can choose different layers if you wish as well. So now we have three objectives. And so therefore, our mask has to be the same size as HW, and it has to have three channels, the same as the number of objectives. And then what I'm going to do is, if you don't know too much NumPy, this isn't going to make too much sense to you, but um, hopefully um, you can get on a uh, like introductory NumPy tutorial. There's lots of them out there. The one on Stanford CS231N is one that I would recommend. It's basically like a primer into NumPy. Um, you can also get a review of NumPy if you go to the math review NumPy. Uh, guide in ML3 guides, and this kind of gets you going on basic NumPy stuff. So, uh, what I do is I'm going to set the first 100 rows in channel 0 to be 1. Everything else is 0, so the first 100 rows are 1. Then the second 100 rows are uh, of the first channel are going to be 1, and then, and then the third channel, 200 to the final uh, th uh, final 100 rows. Are set to one. So basically you have a mask that's sort of like white on top of black, then white in the middle, then white at the bottom. And so we'll let in the, these three gradients uh, pass in accordance to those masks. So if I go ahead and run this, this will take a little while to compute because now it computes, uh, it has to compute the gradient for each individual neuron no matter how big the mask is. And so now it's three times longer than it would otherwise be. And you see the result change the uh, mask so you have these three neurons that are kind of blended together in rectangles. Now the cool thing you could do is first of all again this is the whole deep dream thing so where you do it on top of a uh, pre-existing image we don't actually have this image there actually I think we do so maybe yeah we can go ahead and do this on top of the dog so maybe you know let's actually do it in a different so let's go ahead and run run this again it's going to calculate two objectives and um, the mask is again divided into into actually two columns. Okay, so this will this will go about for a little while, and then and we'll see what we have. Not too bad. Be, be psychedelic. Um, now here's where things get interesting. Here we're setting again. I'm going to set these to be different. Here uh, again, we have two objectives. And the mask is actually using lin space, which is basically a linear interpolation between 0 and 1. So we can actually view those masks. So on one side, it'll be like this, going black to white. And the other side, it'll be going white to black, 1 to 0. Right? So if we use these as, as masks for each channel, I go ahead and run this with two different, uh, two different neurons selected. It'll create a very gradual interpolation of the gradients between the two neurons. So you'll get kind of features of both happening in the middle. If you're if you're a little confused about what this means, I urge you to check out the, the last lecture from Neural Aesthetic, which is lecture number five on, on style optimization in Deep Dream. So this will finish in a few seconds. There we go. So you see that on the left it looks kind of like this, on the right it looks kind of like this, and then in the middle it has elements of both kind of being blended in. 
And since there's 7,500 neurons, there are this many possible combinations, roughly 56 million combinations of neurons to try. We'll never run out of uh, interesting cool aesthetics. Now, masks can be generated in all sorts of ways. Here, what we're doing is we're actually going to um, generate a circle. This is doing a circle in the middle, so we can actually view we can we can view the mask as well. So here, I'll actually go ahead and do that here at the bottom. So we'll display the masks, and uh, so we run this. It's making a circular mask, which kind of blends from the center outward. So it's very similar to the last one, except it's it's circular instead of rectangular. Okay, and this will display the masks for us. Right, and that's, and you can kind of see, and here's the masks. So here's the first one, and there's the second one. So they're kind of inverses of each other, and um, that's the result. Another cool thing you can do is you can set up masks to, uh, seg to segment an image and then grab each of the segments. You can segment the image using k-means clustering, something like that, and then take each of the segments and use those as separate masks. So if we load this dog image in, and then we run the clustering algorithm, we'll get these three masks. And you see that they're kind of, uh, they're, they're all mutually overlapping. Uh, sorry, they're not overlapping, but they, they fill, fill the entire um, shade of the image, the entire plane of the image. So now if we run this again, let's, uh, let's actually use some different neurons. And run this again, and then, oh, I went a little too far to one of these, I suppose. Okay, we went a little too far. I think we have to go downwards. There we go. Okay. So yeah, the, what happened just there now is I tried to grab a neuron that wasn't actually in, uh, wasn't there. Uh, there's only so many neurons for each layer, and you have to look up the number of neurons that each one possesses, each layer possesses up, up here in this lookup table. And don't go above that. Okay, so back down we go. Here's our mask, and then this is our result. So it's kind of blended these three channels together according to the plane of the mask. It's a little hard to see the dog in there, but um, in some cases you'll get a little bit more definition. So then the last cell shows you how to make video. So here's the idea with video. We're going to create a feedback loop. So we'll make the first image, and then we're going to, to remove the border, to kind of crop it and then resize it to the original image and then do the same process again. So if we do that over and over and over, we can create a sort of circular, uh, we can create this infinite zoom in video. Right? So now you can see what's going on. Here's the first one, here's the second one, and you see what's happened is that it's kind of moved in slightly, very slightly. And it's actually saving the images here. So you can kind of see the, the frames being, being um, placed here. And uh, once it's done, we can create a video. An easy way to do that would be to actually just use FFmpeg. So we can go to, uh, so we can go to the uh, notebooks. So ML for a guides, notebooks, and then use FFmpeg dash i frame zero. There's five digits. to put this junk in to make it render an mp4 and then do out mp4 something like that once it's done I don't know if it's done yet yep it's just about done so now I can go ahead and run that and then oop unknown encoder I guess we don't have <laughs> don't actually have ffmpeg properly installed uh, no problem let's see if it'll actually may not actually work Download this. Oh, there we go. There it is. So you see what we just created, basic, basically zooming in. So you can do this forever. Of course, you can do it in a higher resolution. You can try to rotate the canvas. There's a lot of things you can do to make this uh, much more interesting. So that's basically the neural synth example. Um, feel free to have some fun with this. I'm going to delete these. And um, I'd be interested to see what you what you can come up with uh, in the in the near future. I'm gonna I'm gonna upload the um, 
uh, the code that I have for, for uh, generating interesting masks and canvases, and also for creating those loops uh, that I've been showing in class. So that's something to look forward to. Uh, and in the meantime, you can just um, you can just keep going with with the neural synth notebook. And lastly, uh, I just want to talk. I just mentioned a few things about ML for guides in general. The notebooks should be really uh, educational for you. I would highly recommend uh, looking into some of these, um, like for the for example, the image search and image TC that will let you know how to manage uh, feature extraction of images and make interesting applications on top of them. How to set up your own convolutional neural network in Keras, that's another um, topic of interest. This shows you, this is basically an introduction to Keras. And um, all of these should be like a very gentle sort of uh, introduction to how to use these tools a little bit better. So, um, so that's all. Uh, we'll call it there. Um, this session of terminal velocity is, is coming to a close. Hopefully you have enough tools at your disposal to begin to uh, kind of make interesting stuff. And, um, and in the future, we're going to begin a unit on generative models. We'll be using a lot of command line tools um, with remote computation via paper space or whatever other computational environment you can set up. Um, so hopefully, uh, hopefully you can get that up and running before we begin the unit on training our own GANs. Okay, so that's all, and uh, see you later.